Dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being seated. We are going to start this, uh, this afternoon devoted to the role of basic sciences in developing societies. And to start with, we'll have a video by His Excellency, Professor Mohamed Belhossin, who's the African Union Commissioner for Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation. And his, uh, his video, as I said, is also devoted to the role of being sci uh, basic sciences in developing, developing societies. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to stand on established protocols. The investment or reinvestment in STEM education in low to middle income countries is necessary for economic growth. The new sustainable development agenda projects an instrumentalist view of science and technology at the service of human development. Science education has a central place within the new agenda in the context of global challenges such as food security, energy transition, water management, climate change, shrinking biodiversity, and rapid urbanization. Science education can no longer be understood as learning abstracted facts, but should be understood as a process of active inquiry that informs the inquirer's social values and actions. In Africa, at the national level, the commitment to developing STEM education is apparent in long-term national development visions, many of which will remain current into this decade. The knowledge economy view of development regards high-level scientific and technological research as imperative for economic takeoff of the African continent. STEM education, especially at the secondary level, is seen as important for preparing a pool of talented, well-educated youth who can take up their future in a fast-evolving world with more and more complex challenges. But where is the continent at in terms of preparedness to face those challenges? The fourth industrial revolution is here. It has already and is likely to further have a major effect on labor markets, replacing, for instance, factory workers with machines. Our education and vocational systems are not in phase with this revolution. They still propose massive trainings for youth in areas that do not match the current needs of the labor market. A challenge for education systems around the world is to prepare young people for the jobs of the future and not to be the unemployed of the future. In the era of artificial intelligence, robotics, space science, informatics, this provides further rationale for a focus on STEM and digital technologies in education. Africa Union's Agenda 2063 sketches out a strategy within, with science, within which science and technology, uh, innovation and research are seen as the main drivers of the development of knowledge economies. One of the strategic objectives of our Continental Education Strategy for Africa 2016-2025 is to, I quote, strengthen the science and math curricula and disseminate scientific knowledge and the culture of science in the African society, end of quote. Formal education in STEM from basic level is the main vehicle for disseminating science scientific knowledge, both through the curriculum and extracurricular activities. One of the critical challenges facing STEM education in Africa is shortage of suitably qualified teachers. Indeed, increased enrollment in primary and secondary education is associated with the demand for more teachers. In response, in many areas, teachers without the requisite knowledge and skills are employed. Attracting suitably qualified teachers in STEM subjects 
is a challenge as this job is seen as less attractive and less rewarding than other careers. As a result of the shortage of teachers and also of inadequate, inadequate infrastructure in African context, classes are large and often accommodate learners at different stages of learning. There is therefore a tendency for teachers to rely on theoretical explanations and teacher-led approaches. This means that students miss out on crucially important aspects of learning in STEM subjects such as experimentation. It is always difficult for teachers to cope in these circumstances, but in STEM subjects it is often even harder as hands-on work is required with lab equipment, computers and consumable materials. This puts a strain on the systems that are already strained, providing and sustaining basic infrastructure. Other challenges that could be highlighted include the language of instruction and the social perceptions of STEM subjects. To address these challenges, a systemic and flexible approach is needed, focusing on coherence between different elements of the education and training systems, including curriculum assessment and teacher education. There is also the need for more rigorous evaluation of interventions with a focus on what works in raising learning outcomes for all and in all contexts. Finally, governments, together with civil society and the private sector, need to invest or reinvest more in education in general and STEM, in STEM education in particular, and to put emphasis on ways and means to retain and increase their pool of qualified teachers. Harnessing the views of teachers and learners on STEM curricula is also vital for ensuring the relevance and feasibility of changes to the curricula and increasing student engagement. As we engage in this International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development, I want to assure you of our commitment as the African Union Commission to work hand in hand with all our partners under the leadership of UNESCO to contribute to the success of this very important initiative. I thank you for your attention. And now we will have the pleasure to talk maybe more, even more concretely about uh, this role of basic sciences in developing societies. So I have the pleasure to call on stage two of our panelists, Dr. Hani Helal should be here. Um, Professor Hani Helal is Excellency, the former Minister of Scientific Research and Higher Education. Please from the Arab Republic of Egypt. I hope uh, our Nobel Prize Professor Barry Barish is, is around also. 2017 Nobel Laureate in Physics from the USA. Enveloped by your gravitational waves, Barry. And, uh, I hope Dr. Karen Halberg is, is there also. Karen, please. You're a physicist. You're a research director at the Bariloche Atomic Center in Argentina, Argentine Republic. And two more panelists in video, live in video from China, Dr. Rui Bai, I hope I pronounce its way, uh, all right, Life Science, Westlake University, the People's Republic of China, she's online, I hope we will see her, and Dr. Francine Tumi, Medical Science, President and Director General of the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research, Republic of Congo. Happy to have at least three of the panelists here. Um, uh, formerly, and uh, we, ha we, we had a title, which was a very long title. I don't know if you had it uh, under your eyes. Um, it was, uh, the question was, how do scientists 
contribute to the progress toward the sustainable development goals with their results and also in the way they are working and interacting with society. So, you know, such a long question, we had to, to cut it in parts. So, uh, Karen, Barry, and Hani, I hope you'll, 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 you'll answer at least the first question. Um, what we'd like to know is your own results and how they relate to one of the SDGs, maybe of more than one. So, who would like to start? Barry? Yes. So, I, rem I remind everybody that Barry uh, is, is, is a Nobel Prize and uh, is an astronomer, but working, working firmly on the ground, on the ground which has to be very, very stable so that you get your results. So, how what you did with gravitational waves or whatever work you did as a physicist relates to, to SDGs. Well, I, I think the, the thing that uh, strikes me the most and is related to the subject of today, sustainability, is a kind of a unique feature of science, and, and that is that science has no borders. Sp Countries have borders. Speak, speak really in the microphone so that okay. we can hear you very well. Yeah, I said the feature that I'd like to talk about a little bit is that uh, science itself has no borders. Science for around the world is the same, whether you're learning quantum mechanics, whether we discover something like we heard this morning, like the Higgs boson, it has the same importance and meaning around the world or not necessarily uh, physics, but uh, other subjects of science like CRISPR or even gravitational waves have the same meaning around the world. And the, that's maybe not 100% unique to science, but it's unique. And it makes, makes the enterprise the most important and the most useful and the most powerful in terms of the world and sustainability, I think, if the science, as is practiced, is a worldwide uh, enterprise. And so collaborate, large collaborations like we heard about this morning a little bit and more we'll hear about this afternoon, like CERN, uh, is, uh, is a big step forward. Uh, in, if we think back historically, the laboratory, the CERN laboratory was developed and built and put together to bring science together in Europe after the World War II. And so to see the expansion of it taking a role in worldwide science and the importance of science is very important. But as mentioned by Hirosh this morning, that's not the only, we don't have to do it through such big institutions. Um, we do it in small collaborations. We do it in larger collaborations like the one that I've been responsible for in gravitational waves. Uh, in our case, which I'll just mention, it has no, it has funding from governments, but it has no, author governments have no authority over us. It's a scientific collaboration, just as others here might have scientific uh, collaborations with no government uh, influence. Uh, we have uh, more than a thousand scientists around the world from around 100 institutions in 20 or so countries that participate in different ways. And it's done in a way that doesn't have, let's say, the problems that governments have, serving their own uh, community, having borders, having economics that influence it. And it seems to me that gives us a unique uh, situation in order to uh, propagate sustainability, that science should be propagated and have a big priority to be worldwide, to be collaborative, to be open. We hear about uh, openness and whether we do it well or we don't do it well. Uh, in my field, a big thing had been, has been for years trying to have open access, what we call open access. That is, should the journals, if they publish gravitational waves or something else, be open to everyone? And we are trying hard to do that. There's problems economically with supporting journals if you do that, but that's the kind of goals that 
it seems to me we have to have to have as scientists. We don't do everything well, so we have some problems that I think we should admit up front and do better. If we're trying to involve everybody are equally in science, we certainly have to do better at uh, uh, gender equality, for example, um, where we should have as many women as men in okay, science. Ba okay, Barry, but, but when, when we prepared that, uh, uh, that round table, you insisted on just, just to make things clear, uh, uh, goal 17. That's right. Partnerships. Right. To achieve, to achieve the other goals. And well, you just mentioned gender equality. And right. I think I'll pass on the, 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 the microphone to Karen because you. you insisted on yes. that. So could you, could you remind us what, what you do exactly? Uh, I would say, well, you're a physicist. You're in ba Bariloche Atomic Center. This time again, how does it relate? You, you, you're not going to talk only about gender equality, but you're going to talk about that too. Okay, so thank you so much, Barry, for just uh, giving me the, the, the responsibility, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Dominique, for your question. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, I would like to touch on this topic on, on gender equality. It's a, a very important SDG. Uh, so let me just very briefly uh, tell about my personal experience very briefly. I'm um, a quantum physicist, and I do theoretical research in interacting systems, I mean electrons in, in, in novel materials. Uh, so we, we, we program and we code a lot. Uh, I grew up in the north of Argentina in a very small town, and when I was finishing my high school, I really wanted to go in either to physics or to nuclear engineering. And uh, it was very tough for me because the, although my family was supporting me a lot, uh, the society is, was, was not responding, and on the contrary, they were sort of very critical to my, to my decision. They said this, uh, I was sort of weird. Uh, they would say, what are you going to do to study physics? What is that? Are you going to study nuclear engineering because you want to build a bomb? I mean, the people did not understand what I wanted to do. And, and I was even called uh, the atomic girl. Uh, which was not very nice for me. So, I mean, you, uh, as a girl, you do not just uh, go decide to go into science. You have to really go over a strong barrier. And this is uh, the, the message I want to convey. This has to change. Uh, now I am a professor at the, the Balsedo Institute in the south of Argentina, an atomics research center. I teach physics, and I'm also aiming at the, uh, at the quality education, so I'm also uh, teaching, um, I mean, of course, uh, university careers. But gender equality in science is very important. There are some slight changes. UNESCO is doing a lot, UNESCO with L'Oreal and other institutions, but there's a lot to do. The slope is very, very small. We really need a deep cultural change because the, the E, S, and C of UNESCO, education, science, and culture, they're deeply intertwined, and it's very important uh, to try to address women and to try to address also society. And we don't only need groups of women who are talking about our own problems. We need everybody. It's a, it's a problem of the whole society. Thank you, Karen. And you mentioned gender equality. Just to make things clear again, goal five and education, good education. I think all of you will say the same. And quality education is goal four. Well, after that, you have to, to learn everything by heart. <laughs> Professor Elal, uh, you, you were a minister of education, so you, you, you know the problems. I know the problem, yes. From Egypt. <laughs> but I don't know if, uh, if I, uh, I can give this, the solution. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm surrounded by physicists, you know, uh, um, even you yourself is a, is, is, is a in physicist. In the old days, yes. in the old days. In the old days, yeah. Uh, in, in fact, I have prepared my intervention, uh, you know, last week, but uh, when, when I heard what has been said this morning, I said, no, I have to change what I should say uh, to you. And uh, you, we have talked a lot about the, the lessons learned from the, the uh, pandemic and the, the, the importance of, of basic science, etc. Let me go to physics and ask you a question. Do you know how the pyramid was built? Do, do you, all of you knows, uh, you know, the, the, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, Cheops. Do you know how it was built? No one knows. 
still a secret. You know, uh, many, many hypotheses, not theories, because, uh, you know, I'm talking, uh, you know, under the control of physicists, you know, a theory is, is a theory when we can prove it. We, but all what has been said about the pyramids is not approved. Uh, we, we have used physics in order to, you know, scan or discover the pyramids. I think you know the muons, the, the particles, the muon particles that's coming from Mu the muons, muons, muons which go everywhere. Everywhere, and it has been discovered in 1930, if I'm, I'm, I'm correct. It's, it's uh, non-destructive, it's ha ha harmless. And scientists, when they discovered physicists, uh, particle physicists, when they discovered it, nobody knows what they will do with, but now, 90 years or maybe 70 years later, now we used it. We used the muon detectors, you know, either scintillator or gas detector or electronic, whatever you can, you can, you, you, you can say, in order to discover the pyramid. We put the uh, apparatus everywhere in the pyramid and we measured it. We measured the number of muons, the direction, and the, the, the uh, inclination, and we discovered a big void above the Grand Gallery in the pyramid. And we, we published it in Nature. You know, I think all of you know, knows what does it mean. You know, Nature uh, uh, accepted a publication in five weeks, you know, and now we are about to publish another one, you know, having another discovery with a new entrance to the Great Pyramid. Basic science, even if it has been many years ago not very useful, it becomes a very useful nowadays. Thank you. Th th thank you, Dr. Helal. Do, do make us dream a little bit because the voids in the pyramids, mm, everybody wants to understand what was there in the old days. And I, I'm going to do a little bit of publicity for Science et Avenir and La Recherche, in which we published all this work. And what I would add, if I may, is that it helps for collaborations with French people, with, with Japan. And that's, that's, that's something, again, like partnerships that Barry uh, talked about. Yes, you know, just I, I didn't want uh, to take much more time because I, I great, almost said, great. So, you know, it's an international mission. Egyptian, French, Canadian, Japanese, uh, and now German as well. Thank yes. you. Yes. So I hope our Chinese panelist is somewhere out of the sky and space and that she can tell us what she does at Westlake University. Are you here, Dr. Rui Bai? One, two, three. What do the technical people say? Well, we'll try Francine Toumi from Congo, from Republic of Congo. Is she around? Uh, yes, do you hear ah, me? Ah, super. <laughs> Where are you? And tell us what you do and what kind of goals you're pursuing. We're, we're, we're listening to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I, and I'm so sorry to not be in Paris with all of you. So I'm a molecular biologist working on infectious diseases for the past 20 years. And I investigate human and pathogen interactions in order to better prevent or treat or control diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. And uh, if I have to give an example of a link between what I'm doing in the lab and the impact of the population, uh, I would yeah, cite one, uh, working on uh, under five years old children on infect, having severe diarrheal diseases, and we have uh, characterized the genotypes of the, the viruses before the introduction of uh, vaccine again, rotavirus, and we have been able to provide data for the stakeholders to 
ensure that uh, the vaccine that would be introduced would be the, the appropriate one. So that's an example because sometimes, you know, when you work in the lab uh, and um, yeah, people do not see the add value for the population. And of course, on malaria working uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, treatment for pregnant women is something also very important. And uh, so with regard to the um, sustainable goal, it's goal free, of course, uh, better health. Uh, and when we talk about the research, of course, uh, goal uh, 17, partnership. Yeah, also because everything uh, we have achieved here in Congo is in partnership with colleagues from Central Africa and from Europe and abroad. So, yeah, that's what, what can I say? Goal three and goal 17 yeah. and, and, and maybe gender equality also. Oh, yes, but uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, because I'm also engaged here in Brazzaville in uh, promoting, yeah, more female, as mentioned by our colleague from Argentina, <laughs> more female in science and uh, here in Congo only, uh, well, almost 12% uh, female in science. That's not, uh, that's not good. We, so, yeah, I promote, I, I, yeah, do some uh, mentorship and uh, some awards for for um, female um, students and yeah, we try and we engage the society and the scientists because we cannot achieve to have more female if the society is not engaged with scientists to really understand that we will not go to the development without females. So that. <laughs> That's my conviction. So and we try to share that with the population. And I may say it works. Now, more and more uh, parents are really pushing their girls to go into science. Thank you, Francine. You're very convincing. And uh, uh, Dr. Rui Bai, hello. I think you're there, finally. So tell us what you do and uh, which goals you are pursuing. Hello, Dr. Ruibai. You call us from Westlake University. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. My network has a little problem just now, and now it's solved. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ruibai. Uh, it's really my honor to participate uh, in this roundtable. Uh, and I want to talk about the Go3 because my major is biology. Uh, I have been engaged in, in uh, scientific research just for seven years, since 2015. Uh, I think I'm a, a, maybe a junior res researcher. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mainly focused on biology. Uh, my research is about uh, stature and, uh, bio bio and so, uh, my research is about structural and uh, biochemical investigations of the spatosome in order to reveal the mechanism of viral splicing. Uh, splicing of the messenger is very important step during human gene expression related to the central dogma. Uh, in human cells, more than 95% uh, of genes need to be spliced and uh, at least 35% uh, uh, genetic disorder and many diseases such as uh, cancers and uh, real diseases are underlain by missplicing. So uh, in investigation of the splicing is one of the most fundamental and uh, significant problems in life sciences and uh, human health. Uh, it will establish the foundation to pathogenesis uh, of splicing related diseases and uh, provide insight into uh, drug development. And up to now, our team have resolved many important and uh, basic scientific questions about our splicing. And I have uh, enough confidence that our research will help drug development of the related diseases. Um, 
That's all. Dominic, may I add some, some more Th things? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Rebai. Um, you're you're, you're uh, a little bit like Francine, uh, really involved in things which, which uh, uh, directly talk to the, to the society. But that, that was my second question, in fact. How do you manage to interact? You know, we heard this morning, we heard uh, that, well, scientists and politicians have to interact better. And uh, is, it, is it the better way? I wonder, do you have to go through NGOs uh, to, to, to have your message conveyed in another way? H how do you manage? Uh, and and f um, uh, so, sorry, um, uh, Fran Francine, when she, we, we had the feeling that associations, uh, foundations in, in society can help convey your message, you as, as scientists, who wants to, to, to talk first? Karen? May, Karen? May, maybe yes, because I just want to clarify very shortly that the, the numbers of women in science... Talk in uh, the microphone. The, the UNESCO, UNESCO says that one third, this was said this morning, one third of scientists are women. But it's, uh, if, if you look at certain areas in science, if you look at physics, uh, hard sciences, uh, mathematics, computer science, um, in engineering, the numbers are much lower, and it would be very good for UNESCO to discriminate because uh, when, when they talk about science, they include social sciences and also biological sciences where they have a larger amount of women. So it would be the, um, the diagnosis in these sciences is even worse. So I think uh, one has to really take that yeah. into, in, into account. Uh, with respect to your question, Dominique, uh, how uh, do I manage with some... I, I am very... Uh, um, keen on the idea that scientists must uh, engage, as it was said this morning also, with society, in popularization, explaining what we do, uh, also engaging with governments and with the private sector. Um, let me just tell you uh, if, if what I do, for example, is to engage in policy making in, what is, in the Pugwash conferences for science and world affairs that were created by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, so in, the, in 1957. And uh, they, this, is, this institution was created um, with the aim of um, gathering scientists, the military, um, diplomats, so sectors of the social society and the government to discuss in a rational way, using uh, scientific thinking, to discuss political problems. And also, uh, it, they were pioneering in bringing evidence of science to decision making. So this is why they got the Nobel Prize, in, the Peace Nobel Prize in 1955, because they opened channels of communication, which would be very good to restore these days, given the current situation. So they, they really fostered communication between the West and, and the Soviet Union. Union uh, to discuss nuclear disarmament in particular, but also other um, aspects of social responsibility of scientists, in particular the nuclear weapons and, and, uh, and reducing nuclear weapons. So how we use the scientific rationale to discuss political problems, this is another area where it, is, it would be very important for us scientists to engage also with politicians. And th this is why we need many more advisory boards, scientific advisory boards in every country. We need much more exchange between scientists and politi uh, po policy makers. Dr. Halal, you were a minister of education. And these days, younger people, maybe not everywhere in the, in the world, but a lot of them, they're talking about the sus sustainable development. That's what what they care about. So how do you manage to convey uh, uh, an important uh, uh, message like, well, you have to do mathematics and physics and chemistry and learn well if you really want to solve the problems. How do you do? Uh, it's a very difficult question, Dominique. And uh, let me give you a statistics uh, that is um, national and international at, at, you know, at the same time. And I think I have um, some of my colleagues here, including Professor Tokan, who has been also the Minister of Education in Jordan. And uh, uh, the difficulty is that if you look at the statistics, the students at the secondary school, even in, in France, everywhere, there are more than, it depends on the country, between 60 and 70 percent who, who prefer to go to social science 
rather than going to uh, science and maths. This is a, a global statistics, you know, it, it varies from country uh, to, 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 to another. But, uh, and, and even if you look at the people who will go to the universities, you know, uh, and uh, uh, vocational and technical education, you will find the same thing. You know, the majority in higher education are 60 or 70 percent social science. What is the problem? The problem, you know, I has been, you know, I have been a scientist, and now I became a, a, again a scientist, or maybe a manager of science, and I have been passing through different stages of, of society, politics, etc. I think there is a, a big role on us, the scientists, is that we are not addressing the, the correct message to the society. We have to attract this young generation, not at the secondary school, not when they are you know, already grown and, and, and they are going to the university. We should address them when they are at the basic education. You have to attract them. You have to, to, to deliver the messages. I think now, uh, you know, the media, social media, uh, technology allows us now to do anything and the, 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 the kids, even one or two years, if, if you give the, uh, her or him uh, a phone, a mobile phone, they will, they will uh, immediately look for what they would like to do. I think we scientists, we need to change our langu uh, language. Or in other words, we need to learn how to market and simplify and to get our results more attractive. So th does it mean that you have to be on Twitch or TikTok? Why not? Barry, uh, yeah. I, I would like to ask you a, a, another kind of question after what Karen said. Because what I, what I heard, at least in Brussels at times, that if you go to science diplomacy, you might lose some credibility as a scientist, you know. As soon as you approach the political sphere, people tend to think that you, you've become a political person. And is it, um, is it the right thing to believe you? When well. you're a scientist, people tend to think that you, well, after all, you're not, uh, you're saying important things. You're, you're, you're a Nobel Prize after, uh, after yeah. all. I, I don't, those labels don't. <laughs> Uh, I, I actually think the problem is what you said, but something Spe else speak also. Speak in the microphone, yeah. very close. I, I think the real problem that we're talking about, that you talked about, has another aspect, and that is that uh, I, I've dealt with a lot with many governments, not just the U.S. government, because what I do has a lot of resources, and so it's kind of what I have to do. And I think the real problem beyond the training and teaching and all this is that policy, there's too few technically and scientifically trained people that go into policy making occupations. And so if we have nobody that's making policy, I think the problem is gonna be there no matter how hard you try. So it seems to me part of our job is to train, train people scientifically and technically without some barrier that then they can't go into policy making occupations. The final solution, I think, is that, that the policy-making people, if they have sensitivity to science and technology, will make better decisions. Okay. Francine, you, you heard us. Uh, 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 Dr. Rui Bai, you heard us here. W would you like to react? Uh, Francine is speaking. Francine I to me. Uh, Francine, go <laughs> ahead. Yes. From Co Republic I of Congo. Yes, yes, I do agree with what has been said. And uh, uh, really, scientists have to, yeah, to explain what they are doing and to be in politics, because your question, Dominique, I think uh, that's important. I, uh, they are not enough. Here in Africa, we do not have the critical mass of scientists, okay? but. At the same time, if we want to change, as mentioned by uh, our Nobel Prize, I mean, we need to, to, be, uh, to be in the game. We need to be in politics to, for being able to have an impact. Uh, one day, it's 
also the responsibility of scientists after many years of, like our minister, he, he was a scientist, he went to the politics and said, that's very, very important to have more people having different hurts. So I, uh, and to push the, the science agenda, we need to, to push this agenda. And for doing that, we have to go to politics because the, the stakeholders are those who make the decision. As a scientist, we just have results. We have findings. And then how to translate findings into uh, practices, into policies. Ah, it's not our job. We need uh, uh, other, you know, comment ça, passer la main. Uh, so, uh, we need, we need, but the dialogue should be strengthened for sure between between uh, scientists and uh, politicians. But there are uh, uh, people working at Ministry of Public Health, etc. We need to better communicate and using social media to be in twenty twenty two with use and explain what we are doing. Okay. Over. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Ruibai, what, what do you think of all this? Do, do, do you have to fight uh, uh, as much as Francine seems to have to do? Um, yeah. mm, as a, because I'm a young researcher, and I think the answer of this question is, is also I want to know, because I think my uh, uh, in, impact of science is, uh, is is a very little, <laughs> and I, I, I don't know uh, how to uh, share my experience or uh, my uh, research research uh, results. Uh, in my opinion, I just want to uh, participate in more and more uh, meeting and uh, to uh, share my uh, results and uh, communicate with uh, more and more people to um, uh, uh, to uh, make 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 my research uh, uh, let many people know what uh, what we are doing now and uh, we will uh, help the human human health <laughs> and uh, uh, I I so I, it's really a great chance for me to learn to learn more about through uh, this this meeting and uh, in this part I think I'm. Maybe uh, like a listener, <laughs> I have studied many in this part. <laughs> Th thank you, thank you. I, I, I'm sure you learn very fast. <laughs> um, we, we, we have some, some minutes left, but not, not much. Be uh, pardon, je me mets à parler en anglais. I, I don't know. Uh, did I speak in French or did I speak in, in, in English? I, I forgot. <laughs> Alors, je peux parler français, me dit-on, mais c'est absolument charmant. Merci, les interprètes. Nous terminerons cette session par euh, euh, une allocution de... J'espère qu'il est là dans la salle, le docteur Émile Bierumbor, qui conclura en évoquant les travaux de son grand-père Niels Bohr. But before we, we listen to this, uh, to this talk, um, I, 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 would, I would like to, to, uh, to, to, to ask a, a final question, and may, maybe Dr. Weibai will be very happy with what you, you will say. Is finally, if you had to give an advice, well, we heard Francine in a way, but what advice would you give to younger scientists, uh, the one who come, and maybe they, they, they will live in a different world. Uh, so what is it? More education, more, 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 more communication, what, what is it? Dr. Hemi yeah. Elal. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I think very, uh, very brief, two messages. The first one is that there is only one science. Science has started from basic until the end. There is no basic science applied, science innovation, etc. It's one cycle. We have, you know, the, the young people, sh we should not say uh, basic science applied science. We should not distinguish between the different phases. It's one science. This is number one. Number two is partnership, cooperation. 
partnership is the key for progress. Thank you. Karen? Um, yes, thank you, Dominique. Uh, Karen, a physicist from Bariloche Atomic Center in Argentina. Uh, I want to reflect very briefly on something that has not been mentioned too much, which is education and critical thinking. Science is not only information and knowledge. Science is also a way of thinking. Science, science's values include uh, this, uh, arguments based on, on evidence, uh, a healthy amount of, of skepticism, which paradoxically leads to more trust. Think of misinformation. We need to be a little bit uh, skeptical always when we get information, because then we look for the appropriate uh, sources. Then we, uh, it's important to, to teach these skills to young uh, people since they are very, since the beginning, like we teach uh, physical skills. They also need to be trained in critical thinking, which is transversal to all the activities, to all aspects of life. It's not only primitive to science. So independently of what they are going to follow, they have to learn these skills that come from, from mainly from science. It also includes, very briefly, uh, not only uh, skepticism and evidence, but also intellectual honesty. It also includes uh, the possibility of lateral thinking, of in inventiveness, of inspiration or creativeness. And this also has to do with politicians, for example, how we find, how we have lateral thinking to find results by thinking in another way, by looking at different possibilities, different paths. Uh, where we also need to be much more rational, uh, more logic. We, we should be able to understand complex um, uh, pieces of literature, for example, when we have to be more quantitative. Uh, so, I mean, these are important skills. Again, I insist my main message and one of my worries is that we do have to uh, train young people in critical thinking because science is much more than information and knowledge. Science is also a way of thinking. Okay. Francine, I, I saw that you, you agreed, but you have maybe your own message. No, just to add to what has been said, multidisciplinary approach, not to, you know, to work only molecular biology, uh, entomology, to work to have really trans disciplinary, multidisciplinary approach. That would be Thank you, addition. thank you, Francine. And, and maybe it's not that easy because the languages of different sciences is not always the same. Barry, maybe you give the, the last word. Okay, I actually think the statements just made on critical thinking are the most important in this hour, personally. I look at it a little bit differently. I, I think somehow when people are young, we need to treat, teach them what we're, very good as, as scientists, and that's we're very analytical about how we look at the world. Critical thinking always seems so technical, but I think it's being analytical uh, about how you approach anything, whether it's how to drive from here to somewhere else and how you solve the traffic. If people in policy making positions are anywhere in life, we're more analytical as we are as scientists, doing whatever they do, whether it's science or not, we'd all be much better off. In fact, I, I just have a last question. What will you do tomorrow or the day after? What is your next goal? You My go back to Argentina? I, I have to go back. I have to write a paper. <laughs> and, I ha and I have to discuss with, with my student, which is a female student doing her PhD with me. And what will you do, uh, Annie? Continue coordination of the project. <laughs> OK. Barry, back I'm to taking a long flight back to California, <laughs> and then three days later going to Crete. Okay, Francine, back, back, back to the lab. Uh, no, to fight to have more financial support to research in Africa. <laughs> okay, Rui, back to the lab after you listen to everybody. Uh, <laughs> my next goal is uh, to continue to do the research related to human health. And I hope Maris can help promote the treatments and the drugs of uh, many diseases, especially cancers and uh, rare diseases. <laughs> that's, that's very important. I think we can have a round of applause for, for what you told us, and I hope it helps. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and, and maybe we can, we can sit in, in the front there and I ask 
uh, Dr. Emil Bierumbor to conclude. You, you're there? Yeah. Ah, come on. Thank you very much. You want to say here? Or two words. You're okay with that? Uh, just to remind the audience that your grandfather, Niels Bohr, who received the Nobel Prize in 1922, so that's one, uh, 100 years ago, uh, a century ago, and who died in 62, which is 60 years ago, is of course the great physicist who made foundational contribution to the understanding uh, of atomic structure and quantum theory. Well, you know, I like that because I was trained in that, so. And it he was at the same time a philosopher and uh, a promoter of scientific research. That's what we're here for, in a way. And, uh, of course, his dialogue with this other monument of physics, Albert Einstein, is one of the greatest moments in science. Uh, I'll just uh, remind you that uh, he founded the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the University of Copenhagen, and now it's, it's known as the Niels Bohr Institute, if I'm right. And uh, one last thing. He had, uh, um, he had such a role during the Second World War. Well, and maybe you'll talk about that, I but that's so that. important to remind this because that's how scientists are made of. That's, that's, that's very touching. And uh, is, of course, um, so important to the foundation of CERN. We talked about CERN mm. and, uh, and, and also IAEA, and I think you, you'll develop that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this interesting discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, this year is, as we heard, a dual anniversary. It's 100 years ago that Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize in Physics for his groundbreaking atomic model. And that provided a novel and accurate description of the basic nature of atoms. And it also laid the foundation for la what later became quantum mechanics. But it's also the 100 years for his establishment of the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. It was not called Niels Bohr Institute at that time. It was actually the Institute for Theoretical Physics. But it became that in 62 when he died. This place was remarkable from its invention. And it uh, goes both then and now. It was fast a fantastic playground for bright scientists of all nationalities. It was an open discussion forum for um, all the fundamental questions and debates. It witnessed a lot of breakthrough discoveries and Nobel Prizes, and it was the birthplace of the CERN theory division for, in fact, around 10 years. But still, and that's, I think, the important point, the Institute preserved a certain minimalistic hierarchy. It was a playful atmosphere. It was a refuge. It was actually a a place that people during before Second World War went to um, be rescued and, and maybe go to other countries. It was a home for researchers. It was a place where science went hand in hand with intellectual games, with jokes, and with outdoor sports. That was very dear to Nils Bohr. So Nils' vision for scientific organizations are today the norm. We don't question these things. And it's ingrained in our thinking about having a sound and a productive scientific environment. And as this original institute of Niels Bohr, it's fueled by these ideas of openness, equal opportunities, research freedom, and especially this courage to ask the deep questions. Niels Bohr's character was also um, very passionate. He was very, very fearless as a political influencer. He right, right to the top. And an essential aspect of his legacy is to learn from this with the emergence of nuclear weapons and facing their devastating consequences for the world. He simply decided to act and he addressed politicians everywhere with his letter to the United Nations. This philosophy of his was very simple. It was based on open exchange of ideas. It was based on international collaboration, 
and it was based on this drive for new scientific discoveries. And this are all topics that lie at the heart of what we embrace here at this conference. I'm sure that he would have been delighted and he would have felt right at home. So again, I thank the organizers for making, letting me make these remarks about Niels Bohr and his institute and his connection to basic research. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, thank you, Emil. And now you can have a coffee break. We will be back at uh, four, and the moderator will be Ms. Manfela Romfele um, for this talk, Perspective on Basic Sciences and the SDGs. So we go on with this topic. Have a nice coffee. you see each of the vegetables or the uh, crops that are here they have a unique signature of phytochemicals now these phytochemicals they can be used to target uh, special pathways in cancer and stop the progress of the disease the Dushi Nirgin Bujun is a biologist at the University of Mauritius she is a recipient of the Best African Women Researcher Award from Merck Africa in 2017. And she has good reasons to talk about fruits and vegetables from a local market. As we are shooting this video, 800 people may have died from cancer. And around the same number of people have been diagnosed as new cases. When we look in sub-Saharan Africa, 80% of the newly diagnosed cases of cancer are in the advanced stages of uh, the disease. The basic idea is to use uh, natural agent to stop the initial stages of cancer or to stop and reverse the process to malignancy. And on the shelves of this market, examples of beneficial cancer-fighting products abound. We really hope uh, that in the near future we will be able to come up with uh, product development whilst at the same time encouraging the local population to phytochemical rich uh, molecules. There's nothing like studying time scales and spatial scales that far exceed anything that we experience to realize um, that we're pretty insignificant and in fact we can mess this up and it doesn't really make a difference um, to the rest of the universe. If Andrea Ghez, winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2020, makes such remarks, it is because she has her reasons. She works on black holes, especially on the one at the center of our galaxy called Sagittarius A, and her research is at the limits of our understanding of the universe. They represent in some sense, the frontier of our knowledge of how things work. Um, they represent the breakdown of our understanding of the laws of physics. We don't know how to make the laws of general relativity, which describe strong gravity, work together with the laws of quantum mechanics, which describes things that are very small. And black holes are both. So they really encapsulate um, a, a place where we just don't know how the universe works. And to prove, for the first time, the presence of a huge black hole in the center of our galaxy, it took time, much time. The proof of the black hole really went in stages because um, what we could do has evolved with time. It's actually gotten more and more powerful. It's a project in which time, an investment of time really helps because you're studying orbits of stars that, ha um, that are moving around the black hole on time scales of um, 10, 20 years. It is therefore with great hindsight and humility that she perceives humanity and its position in the universe. We're so finite, we're so small. You know, the, if, we, um, if we compress the time of the universe to a calendar year, we're the last second, we're the last hurrah. We actually are pretty fragile little 
um, piece of the universe, and it's our responsibility to take care of this, you know, our backyard. <laughs>
What I didn't sense today is a sense of urgency about the existential crisis we are in. We continue with business as usual with me, myself, and I, and the biggest illustration of this is what happens during the early part of the pandemic when our governments, particularly the wealthy ones, provided research funds, considerable public funds, to the pharmaceutical industry and the researchers. And when finally the vaccines were produced and uh, were being administered, the benefits went to the pharmaceutical industry and the few researchers, many of whom became billionaires at the cost of the public. That's business as usual. We also need to question this idea of basic sciences because I believe that science is a body of knowledge that, we, that has to be interconnected. We talk about open science, it should be open science, which includes the human sciences and the social sciences, because what we have learned over the years is not that we don't have the knowledge, but it is that we are reluctant to turn the knowledge we have into the action that's needed, and that is a matter of behavior. And behavioral sciences would help us to understand what uh, Secretary General Guterres talked about, human beings are waging war against nature, and it is suicidal. And so I believe perhaps we need to remember Dr. Snow, who in 1854 was confronted with the cholera epidemic in Soho in London. He had a sense that it could be the water but his colleagues say you're crazy. And one day he decided enough is enough. He closed the tap. And people stopped dying. Shouldn't we also be thinking of closing the tap on the behaviors that Secretary General Kuteri said are suicidal? And that's really what we would like to talk about today in this panel, that we need to redefine development. The idea of there are developed countries and developing countries assumes we have a notion of what development is about. And if we are that developed, not meeting these minimalist goals, I think tells us that we've got a, a, a way to go. And so I have asked my colleagues on the panel to answer three questions, they could, and they have all decided which and how they want to answer. First is, why has it been difficult for the human community to meet the minimalist SDG agenda in the light of the enormous resources we have, including the science? The second is, can basic sciences close the gap between what we know and what we do not act on in terms of the knowledge we have. And third, what will it take for humanity to learn to know what we need to know and what we need to learn and learn it by acting on it? So those are the questions that Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I just want to uh, make sure that we, we get the, the, the most from our discussions, because some of our panelists are on, online. So I have uh, a scheme that ha will hopefully help us to have the right kind of order. So the first person I want to ask to start us off is Dr. Pereira Lena, uh, who's the Honorary Pro President of the Office of Climate Education. Please, sir. 
Thank you and good evening uh, to all of you. Uh, I am an astrophysicist, but as we have heard this morning through Michel Mayor, the Nobel Prize on exoplanets, uh, my personal interest has also been recently to uh, look at the Earth and its future development. Uh, eradicating poverty and protecting the planet undoubtedly requires the development of basic science, as we have seen all day long, to better understand and to better act. Yet, as long as the necessary messages and actions remain poorly understood by the average people, by the citizens of all the countries, profound changes become out of reach. Just think of the impact of rising the price of gasoline uh, to avoid CO2 production. And educating youth who have the most at stake in the future, in their future, and who strongly demand to be better prepared for it. Let us remember the March for Climate, for instance, before the pandemic. This education is one of the most powerful lever through which to act on a large scale everywhere and for everybody, boy and girl, in the world, as goal number four reminds. I believe that school as usual is no more acceptable than the classical motto, business as usual, which is, of course, rejected by the IPCC. Schools must therefore help all young people, without exception, to understand the rational basis for necessary changes as established by science. But today, in the minds of young people around the world, and as many surveys show in a number of countries, the main catastrophe to come is that of climate change. The youth see the future as catastrophic because of climate. Transmitting knowledge, cultivating discernment of judgment, critical mind, and making young people capable of acting, giving them agency, at their own level, but with hope and values, are therefore major imperatives for schools, as emphasized in Article 12 of the Paris Agreement seven years ago. Through these young people, the messages will reach families and communities. The planet Earth is a complex system, and the basic sciences make it possible to analyze the countless couplings between soil, atmosphere, ocean, and biosphere, transmitting a systemic vision through education while respecting the disciplines that make up the strengths of scientific knowledge is one of the main difficulties to be reached, to, to be resolved. The transformation of curricula, but more the preparation and support of hundreds of millions of teachers is the major objective of climate change education. This support cannot succeed without a commitment from the scientific community in basic science. This is what I believe and I think that's what is already proven by experience. Thank you very much, but I think we need to question how we define education because I come from the Club of Rome where in 1972 we published a report, The Limits to Growth, the scientists and very educated policymakers rejected it. So it's not just education, it's something else. That's why we need to think more broadly. Um, Professor Abdulaziz, I hope I pronounce it correctly. You are a biochemist and you are in Nigeria and you made a very bold decision. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to go home. Tell us about what we need to do more than what we are doing. Uh -huh. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here. And um, much more of an, uh, it's also a pleasure and much more of a pleasure to be a scientist and a scientist about chemist. Um, her question, why has it been difficult to meet SDGs? 
for me, I'm a scientist, I'm a biochemist, and um, I'm first a biochemist, and my specialization is in cancer therapeutics and drug development. And um, we all know the effects of this disease and so many other non-communicable diseases, because I know the MDGs help to solve a lot of problems with the communicable diseases. And then we had the non-communicable diseases, prevalence in non-communicable diseases, including cancer, which is one, um, the second um, killer disease in the world. Although now in developed countries, we have fewer people, fewer mortality than we have in low and middle income countries. Why has it been difficult? For me, one of the difficulties in meeting the SDGs is the constraints to upscaling of innovation. Okay, you are trying to develop a drug, maybe from plants, some animal sources, microorganisms, and so on and so forth. But in our universities, especially in Africa, um, researches from basic sciences are just dumped because of constraints in upscaling, innovation, the general acceptance, and then implementation. We have a lot of scientists. We have Africans that are carrying out, that have groundbreaking researches. But due to problems of upscaling, allowing these um, innovations to reach the target groups, allowing data to be, obtaining data and then implementing the results. This is very difficult. Why? Number one, there's inadequate support from institutions. Our governments do not expend on education, talk more on basic research and R&D. In the long run, we have scientists with innovations but are secretive or most of the time, it withhold their findings, and then others are more, you know, interested in financial gains. And so they partner with other multinationals because they need support for their research. Another difficulty is inadequate education and manpower. The the progress of research in Africa is not adequately captured. And uh, we would not understand, or it would be difficult for us to see how it contributes to the SDGs. Because there is a um, death of um, skilled personnel that will be able to carry out this task. And if there's a death of skilled personnel, then there's a data gap. And with the data gap, there's the problem that these SDGs will be difficult or almost impossible to meet. Thirdly, instability. We have conflicts and we have sometimes frequent change of governments. You have a government with policies that may not, some may not favor researchers. And then sometimes, most of the times, you have conflicts in West Africa now, some countries you see uh, different conflicts and so on. So all this affects research. All this make it difficult to meet top the SDGs. Then we also have mismatch of interventions. Like you have the government is interested in one area of research. And of course, as I said earlier, they do not uh, fund research. They do, like for my la uh, laboratory, what we have now is uh, um, funding from the government, um, but it's not enough. You need collaborations. And so you have um, multinationals also coming in, and we shouldn't forget they also have their interest, and some may not meet up to the SDGs. And in such cases, the government will not um, contribute adequately, so affecting the researchers as well as the ability to meet up with SDGs, even if their researches are geared towards that. Thank you.
So it sounds like all your, the impediments you have named are really about behaviors, about how we conceive of governance, and so we need to broaden our uh, horizon in terms of we have tried with, to look at only the science here and the politics there, but clearly what you're saying is that we've got to take a holistic view. And that then leads us to call online Professor Yao, who is very late for him today. And we thank you very much for staying awake for us uh, and to share with us your thoughts about the uh, impediments to meeting this very minimalist uh, agenda of the SDGs. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, working at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, which is one of the headquarters of uh, basic science research in the world, I think. And uh, I was also introduced that I'm uh, leading an uh, international program called the Third Pole Environment. Uh, this uh, third pole environment is also uh, a UNESCO uh, flagship program uh, sponsored since 2011. So my work uh, in basic science and also my experience working with the international scientists with the third pole environment uh, uh, make me I think it's possible to uh, uh, discuss about the first issue. Uh, the third pole is uh, actually is a name uh, talking about the Tibetan Plateau and its surroundings. Uh, why it's called the third pole? Because we have first pole, uh, Arctic, uh, the second pole, Antarctic. Uh, the third pole is uh, the environment is very similar with the Arctic and the Antarctic. And in this region, we have around 2 billion people. Uh, so it's the uh, most populated region and also it's a key region uh, to meet SDGs. Uh, so that's why we think if we find some way uh, to be uh, efficient to meet the uh, SDGs is not a model for other regions or worldwide. So uh, what we have done, and, uh, we achieved is uh, something uh, related to climate change and also to uh, adaptation to climate change because this world, this part of the world is uh, uh, climate warming is uh, uh, twice as fast as a global average. Uh, so what we uh, proposed from the uh, basic science study in this region is that uh, a, a holistic management of earth system science or earth system processes, including cryosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, uh, and uh, atmosphere. Uh, so in that way, uh, kind of uh, uh, green and low carbon, no carbon development is in the is a future for the, the region to meet the SDGs. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, the Chinese kind of sciences has established the. Uh, uh, it's called a big data bank, or you could call that big data platform uh, for sustainable development by integrating in situ measurement data, uh, remote sensing data, social statics data, and other data, along with uh, informatics products. Uh, so the data resource will help to practice uh, help the practice to meet SDGs. Uh, so in, in, in conclusion, uh, 
I think that green and low carbon development uh, support by basic science achievement will be a new way to meet SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your approach is clearly very innovative, it's holistic, and you touching many spheres, including many region, I mean many countries in your region. And I think we can all learn something uh, from you. Uh, we now move to Professor Luca Machetti who's a computational biologist at the University of Trento in Italy. And uh, we would like to hear your views. Good evening, everybody. So it's a big pleasure to be here. In addition to the group that I supervise at the University of Trento, I also super, I'm also head of computational biology in a foundation that is 50% Microsoft Research, located in North Italy. What we do is promoting uh, computational biology, essentially, so we work in the third goal, of course, so ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being at all ages in any country. So what we do, we develop mathematical models to learn how diseases are working, plan and predict their behavior, plan research, of course. So we work with rare diseases. We start, uh, we have programs in um, uh, problems that may arise uh, during pregnancy, then pediatric conditions, problems related to aging. So we try to follow, I mean, uh, with the different projects, all the aspects of the human health. We are also involved in rare diseases like uh, lysosomal storage disorders and, and so on. So, the, the panelists asked three very interesting questions, so I will try to provide my recipe, at least for two of them. So why is so difficult? <laughs> I supervise a group in computational biology that merged a lot of different backgrounds, as you can imagine. So we, we range from computer scientists to biologists, medical doctors. And I know how much difficult it is to communicate in between scientists. So communication, I think, is still a problem. It's something, I mean, that has been discussed a lot today, so I don't want to repeat it too much. But uh, I know how much is difficult to communicate in between scientists, and let's imagine how much difficult it will become if you have to speak with someone else that is not a scientist. Uh, we have to find a way for marketing our results in some way, okay? And uh, in my work, an interesting perspective could be also to bridge with the applicative domain. I'm not going to tell that we have to evaluate basic research in, in terms of what happens in six months, because of course this is, this is not correct. But uh, I strongly believe that there is only one science, okay? Uh, this is something has been said also in the previous session. And I think that maybe the applicative domain can provide some hints to market the results and provide to people that are not scientists good ideas of what we can do. Second question, basic science can close the gap. So I will end with this. I strongly believe yes, of course. Uh, in any of the projects that I supervise, uh, even those that are very applicative, at the very end, uh, the real engine for the discovery is the basic research that we develop. So it's true, we develop the models, but we also work in the algorithm and in all the basic results that assist the modeling. And at the very end, the discovery, even the applicative one, is the results of the basic research <laughs> that is done in parallel, okay, on a long path. So thank you, thank you very much. Well, you are clearly challenging your colleagues here who are scientists that we need to, they need to learn to communicate better amongst themselves, and then, of course, uh, with the rest of us, who are nine non-scientists. We now turn to Professor uh, Seda, and I can't pronounce your name, unfortunately, he's a chemical physicist uh, from Kepler University in the Republic of Austria. He is on video. Today, I want to share our basic science approach for the SDG number seven. 
And this is the clean and affordable energy. And this we can achieve with solar energy. And indeed, if you look to the solar map of the world, then one can see that solar energy is widely spread and irradiating in most parts of the planet. And admittedly, the poorest parts, like in Africa, they got the most solar energy. So this is also good for fighting poverty. And if we look to the peace aspect, then solar energy, of course, is very positively contributing to world peace, as opposed to the oil war of the last several decades. Solar energy can be converted to heat. This is solar water heaters. They are known, as you can see here, since the days of 1890. And this technology has been preceded by solar energy conversion into direct electricity. This is photovoltaic. And this report from at and to Bell Lab from 1954 opened up the entire technology of silicon solar cell industry today. And if we look to this efficiency chart of National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, then you can see also University of Linz address here in this chart because of our contribution in organic and hybrid solar cells in, since around 2000. If we look to the next challenge on solar energy conversion, it's clearly the solar energy conversion into chemical energy. And this is needed because the solar energy conversion and solar energy consumption, not at the same place and at the same time occurring. Therefore, we need a transportable fuel created by solar energy conversion so that we can store it or ship it. And in that sense, I am in big favor of recycling CO2 to create artificial fuels using, for example, solar or wind energy. This is our field of research. And at last slide, I want to show you just an example that we can use even biological catalysts, enzymes, to put them on the electrodes and directly use them in bio electrocatalytic systems to convert, for example, CO2 into methane or methanol. So basic science is very important to attack the problems addressed in what we call sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one question I have, which comes from people who know more than I do, is that there is a dark side of this uh, solar energy in terms of the solar panels that we produce and the storage and the battery matters that arises out of that. And I come from a continent which has both the sun and the rare metals that are used for batteries. We need to talk about how we deal with the, the dark side of this fantastic technology. So now we turn to another of our panelists who's online. He's a, uh, is Professor Pu, who's a neuroscientist and a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences of the People's Republic of Ch China. And uh, he will also bring his perspective to the three questions that we are facing. Professor Pu? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I would like to um, uh, talk about two things. First, as an uh, educator uh, in biology and in neuroscience for 30, 40 years now, I have a strong feeling that uh, basic scientists, uh, neuroscientists in particular, are not uh, doing very well in their education. Uh, for the students as well as for the general public. Now, there is uh, clearly a lot of misinformation. No, uh, everybody's interested in the brain. Uh, general publics are very interested in the brain. What happened to, why can I sleep? Uh, why, why, have I, why do I ha uh, have a depression? Or 
the, the uh, Alzheimer's. I, these are many uh, urgent questions uh, that uh, general public wants to understand, uh, want to get help. So the health, there's a health urgency. We are according to WHO, 30% um, of disease burden, societal disease burden uh, comes from uh, brain disorders, uh, all, all kinds of brain disorders. So uh, uh, if we don't find solutions, our medical system will not cope with it. Uh, in 20, 30 years, we, uh, we'll have real trouble in terms of uh, uh, sustainable development. Uh, so I, I think uh, uh, the basic scientist needs to, first of all, educate not only the students. I heard, we heard a lot about uh, teaching students science and uh, the standard education, but I think there's a great need of teaching the public. We want scientific citizens as well as scientists. And in fact, uh, that's the, what basic science needs to do. Uh, a group of our senior uh, uh, member of our Chinese Academy now are uh, 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 given a regular uh, uh, popular science talks in different areas, trying to uh, clear out the misunderstandings and uh, half truths that are so widespread in the society. The basic scientists are usually doesn't want to do this because they. Uh, it doesn't help their career. They want to be uh, doing real research in the laboratory, publishing papers, uh, promoting their careers. And I think uh, to bridge the gap, there, there, are, there has to be a race of consciousness among the scientists, the basic scientists, that they need to go out of the laboratories, doing uh, real education to the society, uh, spend more effort in the, in the education. So that's, uh, that's one of uh, the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is another urgency uh, we are facing now uh, after the COVID-19. Uh, it turns out that there's uh, uh, substantial evidence now for people who are infected with COVID-19 virus, uh, uh, SARS-2 uh, uh, virus, um, the convalescent patients who have uh, suffered from disease during their recovery, or even the not asymptomatic uh, 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 patients or subjects infected, they will have um, cognitive disorders or decline. Uh, they'll say uh, either the COVID-19 direct infection affected the brain, or there are indirect effects uh, uh, because of the uh, social environment, the social isolation, depression, anxiety, all this cumulate together. And especially for the aged, aged patients or aged uh, people, um, infected or not infected, they, uh, their cognitive decline is shown to be faster, to be accelerated. Uh, during the uh, six month periods after uh, COVID or after isolation. Uh, so I think the, the society is gonna face a, a very urgent problem in terms of dealing with this. Uh, as a brain scientist, I'm, uh, we need to do something because uh, we need to do, uh, first of all, very uh, large scale. Uh, I think you uh, need to market. conclude now. Yeah, large scale work in terms of uh, diagnostic and perhaps intervention for the brain disease. So that's an urgent matter uh, that's uh, become uh, a really a, a subject, uh, should be a subject of focus for brain scientists. Thank you very much. It's interesting that you, uh, you are a neuroscientist and you talk about brain scientists, but I think uh, neuroscience is teaching us that the mind, body, and soul are together and the example you've used of COVID is a reminder, and so I support your call for scientists to be much more engaged with what's happening in societal terms. Uh, the next uh, panelist would be, will be online as well, is Professor Bustamante, who's an ecologist from the University of Brasilia uh, in Brazil. 
Professor, you are online. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for the introduction. And I thank the organizers for the invitation to participate at this moment in which we highlight the role of basic science in achieving sustainable development goals. I speak today from Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, and the heart of the second largest biome in South America, the Cerrado. Considering the most biodiverse savanna in the world and yet highly threatened by the rapid loss of habitats. Many ecosystems share the same threats. When we evaluated the 17 sustainable development goals, it is essential to remember that the biosphere based goals underpin the social and economic goals. In this context, the fundamental questions of ecological science are central to advancing the sustainability agenda. How organisms interact with each other and the environment, the dynamics of environmental change, and interactions between ecology and evolution. This basic knowledge is required to answer applied questions critical to managing natural ecosystems and the goods and services they provide. Earth's millions of species influence a wide range of environmental processes, as shown by theoretical and empirical research. However, globally, ecosystems are rapidly losing taxonomic, genetic, and functional diversity due to human appropriation of natural resources, modification of habitats and climate, and the spread of pathogenic and exotic organisms. In especially, the destruction of ecosystems is taking place rapidly in the tropics. To find an answer to obvious questions of how many species are there, how their ecosystems work, and so forth, we will need to do the best we can as soon as we can. So far, we have named no more than 10% of tropical plants and animals. And at the current rates of discovery, most are likely to be long gone before we become aware of their existence. Although evidence suggests a positive relationship between biodiversity and ecosystems functioning, few studies have addressed tropical ecosystems in which the highest levels of biodiversity occur. We need more tropical research to support global efforts to achieve environmental sustainability in the face of rising extinction rates. The distribution of global biodiversity is uneven. Of the top 17 megadiverse countries, 15 are in the global south. The Convention of Biological Diversity recognizes the general, general lack of information and knowledge regarding biodiversity. It considers the particular needs of developing countries for scientific and technical education and training for identification, conservation, and sustainable use of biological diversity. And here, it's also important to highlight the value of different knowledge systems. Globally, indigenous peoples account for only 5% of the population, but they protect and care for 80% of remaining biodiversity. They are also among the poorest and most socially excluded in the world. The financial support for basic scientific investigation is crucial investment for the future. Fundamental scientific studies on biodiversity and ecosystems can pave the way to sustainable societies by providing the knowledge to link environmental health and integrity to human well-being. So thank you very much. Thank you for raising an important issue of the knowledge system which consists of the wisdom of indigenous cultures and knowledge systems and the modern science and technology. But you also raise the issue of the commons, which you also raise, uh, Manzura, in terms of if we value this knowledge, uh, both the indigenous wisdom knowledge and modern science, how do we make sure that we contribute to the development of this knowledge, its preservation and its distribution in areas where people don't have the resources? And so global equity raises it, I mean, it, it's important to have global e uh, equity considered in the context of knowledge uh, generation and distribution. Our last uh, panelist uh, is Dr. Aguila, who is the Director of Research and Development at L'Oreal. And uh, I'm very keenly interested to hear how beauty can become an essential need uh, in society. 
is already one if I have to be <laughs> provocative. <laughs> Thank you, I'm really delighted to be with you to uh, tell you how basic science at L'Oréal are important in order and contributing to advanced SDGs and uh, uh, tomorrow solving challenge of the world. So let me just remind everyone, as you may all know, L'Oréal was born uh, from science and created by a chemist, uh, Professor and uh, Eugène Schueller. And since inception, science has been at the heart of the core business model of L'Oréal. And we all believe uh, for the last 110 years that the performance of the company is really built by the science and by the products and the performance and the quality of the products. So just to remind that every day, close to the diversity of our consumers, we have 4,000 researchers, among which 700 involved in what we can attribute to basic science, to push the boundary of science and create the beauty that moves the world. So to uh, have to take this uh, challenge. We do believe that science and innovation is the only way to take it. And then uh, to transform our own activities continuously and to respect the uh, planet limits and the SDGs. And for that, we have launched a big transformative program at L'Oréal called L'Oréal for the Future. And this program embraced the SDGs, uh, fighting the climate change, um, managing water sustainability, preserving resources and diversity. And to do that, we really need basic science and the convergence of different expertise. This is crucial in order to address key four expertise that we have internally. First is agronomy, agronomy 2.0, I would say. We choose technology to cultivate plants in a much more sustainable way while protecting biodiversity, guaranteeing supply without diminishing planet resources. The second, and you evoke it, it's biotechnology and fermentation, how to create new ingredients and uh, functional raw materials through the culture of microbes. Uh, and I have to say, this is the uh, really, we understood that there is a time between the research and time to the market. As a company, we really see the difference. And I will put it in front of the RNA vaccines as the discovery of RNA is 1961 with Professor and Nobel Prize Francois Jacob. And we had to wait about 40 years before transforming somehow this uh, scientific discovery into uh, concrete applications. The third one is the green extractions and the green chemistry, which is really key for us to uh, decrease the uh, um, solvents and the uh, uh, having a better green energy and uh, having non-petrochemical uh, solvents. And uh, of course, uh, we have set uh, truly ambitious KPI and uh, all the researchers are committed towards uh, uh, this uh, strategy and uh, we already have uh, tangible uh, results uh, through our formulas, through our products with 59% uh, of raw material coming from renewable plant-based sources and 80% of which biodegradable. So what we put as a, a, a huge a urge for the scientists is also to have 100% of our formula being eco-design, being uh, respecting the aquatic ecosystem, and 95% with raw material coming from these renewable plant-based sources and uh, abundant minerals. So last, I want to comment, is the uh, necessary advances that need to be shared and uh, very transparently with our consumers that will allow us to, to make their own choices and uh, take, of course, uh, the most planet-friendly products at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are lots of issues uh, arising from this uh, beauty industry. But I want to get back to the issue you raised, Professor, about uh, 
schooling, we, we don't need schooling as usual. We need a, a transformative, beyond education, transformative learning, because it's not just the children and the young people who have to learn. We have to learn anew how to be human in this current environment we are in. What, what are your comments? Well, thank you for raising the point because I think there are two aspects really. One is to convey to the youth, to the young generation, the knowledge and uh, the systemic vision of the Earth as a global system with many interactions, which is very complex. So this calls in, in curricula, in teacher training, for deep transformation, not to uh, forget the, the discipline, the subjects which make the analytical power of science, but also to give the more complex, more holistic, more global vision. So this is one aspect of knowledge. But the other aspect are values. I mean, we cannot raise the youth without a vision of social justice, of climate justice which are not taught by science, but are absolutely essential, but are not imposed by rational thinking of science. I mean. Thank you. Now, talking of social justice, how do we have social justice for uh, Manzura, who's working in a resource-constrained environment, but doing absolutely essential research? What would you like to see being done to promote global equity with respect to resourcing of research and implementation of your outcomes? Um, um, the first is um, governments, not just, I think we have gone past relying on the developed countries, the low and middle income countries who also need to, to, to brace up, I mean, to, to get up from this, their slumbers. We need to educate the leaders. All we need to, we, we need to bring, I mean, voting leaders that understand more about education. And so they are able to fund education and then fund research and uh, R&Ds. Because most of the times our governments are really not um, probably because of the economy, everybody is concerned about the economy and so on. So I would want, like, it would be very good to, like, educate the government of the developing countries. We don't have to wait. But then, just like the number 17 SDGs, there is need for partnership. Our laboratory does not just wait for the government. We also collaborate with other scientists, like I have worked with um, Professor Angela Nieto, who had got who got the L'Oreal UNESCO Award some weeks back, and um, with fundings also from the Spanish government, and also some universities in the United Kingdom. We could work together, but sincerely speaking, we can we shouldn't sit down and wait for them. We also need to, I could I have the opportunity, I had the opportunity of staying back in some of these places, but I didn't because I wanted to see something being done in my country. But then sincerely speaking, it is really, really difficult. Thank you. You really made the point. I want to come take your point of partnership with regard to indigenous knowledge systems that our sister from Brazil was raising. How do we promote global equity with regard to the commons, which is indigenous wisdom combined with uh, modern wisdom so that, or no, modern knowledge, so that we can tackle the challenges, the existential challenges that we face with the benefits of that wisdom? What would you propose need to be done for us as a global community to contribute to the commons that is uh, indigenous wisdom and knowledge? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's a quite important one. I would like also to, to make a point about the, 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 the issue on values. So when you think about climate justice, environmental justices, we have there also profound ethical questions. 
and thus also involve the respect uh, to the rights of indigenous peoples, land tenure, and the respect to their territories so that they can keep their existing modes. So I think that we have now a lot of important conventions like the UNFCCC, the Global Biodiversity Conventions, that are putting increase, increasing pressure to uh, national governments to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples. I think that is an important aspect, but also we need to educate scientists to understand these different knowledge systems and to interact in a very respectful way with different ways to, to think about the world we are uh, living, in which are we living together. So I think that this are some issues that are concerned to the governments, but are also issues, important issues that are concerned to the academy world, so that we can recognize the different ways to see the world. Thank you. Professor Pu, you talked about a very innovative concept of how you, have, you are promoting collaboration in your region, so people don't just look at one thing. That clearly means you don't uh, focus on individual disciplines. How do you manage to get the scientists who, at the best of times, are a challenge to get to communicate amongst themselves? How, do you, how did you get it right to get people to work together in ecosystems and across countries? Um, it is uh, uh, an effort that, uh, um, uh, that really needs to be uh, made. Uh, the teamwork, the partnership and the teamwork is really required to solve some of the major problems we see uh, we are facing. And I think uh, uh, the scientists uh, used to uh, are more inclined to work uh, in their own laboratories uh, to in order to forge uh, teamwork, we need to have incentives where we have to uh, to uh, have a common, first of all, have, have a common goal, and then the government uh, or the uh, institute has to help to organize people so that they see the benefit of teamwork and to see the common, uh, to uh, achieve the common goal, uh, they would, uh, uh, would get reward from it. I, basically, uh, people have to uh, to get uh, get uh, used to teamwork uh, and then uh, to participate. Thank you. I want to go back to the issue of uh, solar uh, energy sources and the wonderful work that you're doing, uh, Professor, in uh, Austria. How do you see the collaboration between Europe, which doesn't have so much sun, according to your own uh, map, and countries like, or continents like mine in Africa, where we have got plenty of sun, but we could use some of the knowledge and the technology and the resources to leverage that. How do you see it working? Do we still have Professor, oh no, I think he was on video. He probably is not there now anymore. Okay. Anybody who wants to tackle that? There is a gaping, oh, an opportunity between Europe and Africa with regard to solar energy. Africa has got plenty of sun. Europe has limited sun, except with global warming, you have a bit more. How do you see collaboration in the interests of global equity between uh, Europe and Africa to use uh, renewable energy sources like the sun? If I may, uh, I would like to make a comment on that. Uh, yes? I yeah, think just very quickly important. because I want to give somebody yeah. else a chance. Okay, okay, just very quickly, one important issue when we talk about climate change mitigation is how we are going to close the gap in terms of financing the green transition in developing countries. I think this is a critical issue, so very quickly. Thank you. What's your response? I, 
I think it's a wonderful opportunity, I mean, to devote uh, funding to Africa and uh, increasing, I mean, uh, also the, the communication <laughs> with, the local, with the local people. Of course, uh, I mean, uh, there are major challenges to do because, uh, I mean, uh, green energy is very important, but it's difficult to explain that to people that is hungry. So, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of problems that we have to solve, but I totally agree that it would be very, very important and a big challenge to do together. So uh, a very important opportunity of collaboration. Thank you. I want to, yeah, quick word okay. because I want to give somebody For me, else. I see it as a win-win situation between Africa and Europe. For Africa having the sunlight and then needing the energy because we have major problem in terms of energy. Maybe South Africa might be better, but for us in Nigeria, it's a really terrible situation when it comes to energy. And most of our laboratories rely on solar powers, solar power. So I think it's a win-win situation for both if um, scientists from Europe and Africa cooperate. While also here, I see there are also people that utilize the solar energy that's creating their own source of energy themselves instead of you know, relying on the more expensive one. But then it serves as a source of income also, increase the GDP of Europe. Thank you. Last word. Yes, I, I think a way is to break the silos between the different scientific uh, fields on one way and, and also silos between the different level of science from basic to application and then transformation. So I think that from the upstream of any projects, we need to have all this convergence all the, with different uh, common goal, but different interests at the end. And this is the way I should, we should tackle such an ambitious uh, problem. Thank you very much. I think all of you are emphasizing one important issue, which is we are one. We are one humanity. We have an existential set of crises upon us, and we're not going to be able to come on the other side of those crises unless we learn to work together because human beings are relational by nature. And if we don't cherish that relationality, we have a problem. We've got, I've got good news for you. We've been sitting the whole day. There is music. There is a musical interlude with Dennis Test, who's, I hope I'm pronouncing you correctly, uh, who are going to give us a lovely interview to feed our souls. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. <laughs> Thank you. 
Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Namasté, peace. It is my pleasure to invite to the stage uh, participants in the last panel focusing on what people have been talking about, which is how do we collaborate basic sciences from around the globe? How can we strengthen our collaborations? The first uh, panelist is Ursula Basler, Dr. Ursula Basler, who is research director at, uh, and former president of CERN. The second is from Jordan, Dr. Khalid uh, Tukan. The third is uh, Dr. Dabulka, who's the director of Addis uh, Salama, Salam uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, Dr. Tukan is from Sesame. And then we have online for Dr. Mohamed Hassan, who is the president of World Academy of Sciences. And on video, Dr. Mike Stratton, director of Welcome Sanger Institute in the UK. So, I... Uh, Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Ursula Basla. Yes, thank you very much. You asked in the beginning uh, what about realization of the sustainable development goals. And uh, I think from a perspective of particle physicists, it looks much more complicated than discovering the Higgs boson. So um, I think there are many political, social questions associated to it. And naturally, I hope also that research in humanities and social sciences will help in realizing uh, and, and overcoming these problems, especially as uh, war pandemics really affected the realization of them. Uh, however, I mean, I'm very impressed also by all the effort and the intelligence that goes into the planning of realization of this global sustainable goals, uh, the monitoring of uh, the evolution uh, of the goals. And I think this is a method that we also use in our disciplines, actually. Now, what can basic science, particle physics, bring to the social, this uh, sustainable development goals? Um, Naturally, we are missioned at CERN for looking into the fundamental laws of the universe. However, sustainable development goals are very important to us. And what we can contribute is maybe already our existence, reuniting people from all over the world in order to solve a complicated problem. Uh, bringing people from more than 100 nations together with a common goal, subscribing to common values. And I think this is, has already been mentioned in the previous panel, but this is an important issue to share a common goal, to share common values. Uh, as was mentioned this morning by uh, uh, Rolf Heuer, Director General, uh, the Higgs boson was an emblematic discovery, uh, provoking a lot of interest from the general public. Now, the Higgs boson was 10 years ago, However, you should understand that LHC produced more than 3,000 scientific publications, generating more than 10,000 publications that reference these scientific results. In order to make this, uh, these results known, CERN was a precursor for open science publication. With the Scope 3 initiative, uh, about more than 50,000 publications are globally, openly available now, and stimulating scientific exchange with countries that have never been seen on this land, on, this, on the map before. Dissemination, education, summer students are coming to CERN from more than 70 countries. This is 
completely important. Now, fundamental research is looking to disruptive results. Uh, there is the saying, you cannot, improve the ca the, you cannot invent electricity by improving the candle. At some point, you have to invest in trying to increase the knowledge, and then it may take decennies until the technologies come. However, without this research, they will never come. On the way there, we are developing applications that may already be important now. For our next projects, we know that we need to improve our energy efficiency, our environmental impact. CERN was one of the first research infrastructures that looked into its environmental impact and that is monitoring in order to try to efficiently reduce it. And I think this is an example that is also valid for other domains. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to hurry you, but uh, we're running out of time. Uh, Dr. Tukan, you are in an, an institution that really embodies collaboration. Can we have a few words from you? Yes. Uh, I would uh, talk about Sesame. Today we have heard this morning from Shamila, and also uh, we heard from Rolf Heyer about a really a success story uh, of establishing an international research center in the Middle East that involved mainly collaboration from probably all continents around the globe. Uh, at the beginning, there was a lot of skepticism about Sesame because there were technological challenges to build a synchrotron really is an involved technological and scientific challenge. In addition to political tensions in our region, as you know, since World War II, the Middle East has been uh, probably wrecked by continuous wars, revolutions, name it. And uh, there were also financial challenges when it came to supporting a very advanced scientific research center with limited budgets in the region. However, I should say that we succeeded, and this couldn't have been made possible had it not been for international collaboration in science. Where different countries in the region, namely we had eight member states from the region, but more importantly, we had the support of the international scientific community and also international of major international organizations, namely UNESCO, where uh, UNESCO played a major role in establishing uh, SESAMI, uh, where we, these first statutes uh, for SESAMI built on the model of CERN were established and deposited at UNESCO. Uh, uh, the first meetings to really discuss SESAMI, some of it c uh, were held in this hall and some of it in other neighboring halls. International Atomic Energy Agency played a ma major role, European uh, Commission, also uh, uh, supported that, in addition to the international scientific community in Europe, United States, Japan. And today, actually, as Sesame is uh, becoming alive, uh, we are really producing a world-class science. Uh, we have a total of probably uh, 27 countries uh, with uh, uh, probably uh, 316 proposals being received, uh, uh, publications are coming out of SESAMI, and uh, currently we have three uh, uh, beam lines active. Uh, one has been commissioned recently, uh, the Softray X beam line, in, uh, su supported by the Helmholtz Foundation in Germany. Uh, another beam line is being built uh, by the uh, Turkish scientific community and a uh, 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 six beam line, which is an advanced tomography beam line, uh, is uh, being built and will be commissioned at the end of this year. Uh, Sesame has contributed. We are a user facility opening its doors to the international scientific community from the Middle East and all around, and we could see uh, the spectrum of research being done in line with uh, uh, supporting development goals when it comes to materials, new energy, climate change, uh, st uh, stimulating STEM education, 
uh, we have uh, experiments being done on the MOFs, metallic organic frameworks uh, for some advanced research in order to prepare new materials, materials for new electric batteries, uh, research done on health, uh, pharmaceuticals, catalysis, and uh, by all accounts, cultural heritage and also archaeology. Uh, Sesame being uh, located in the Middle East, which is the cradle of human history, uh, we could see that uh, we have been very active in supporting uh, scientific uh, uh, research in archaeology and cultural heritage spanning a uh, long history. From thousands of years, we have been uh, looking at ancient Egyptian mummies. We have looking, uh, been looking at bones and teeth uh, from the Roman era. Uh, also, uh, some manuscripts uh, from the modern uh, Middle East. Uh, so by all accounts, international collaboration is really pivotal when it comes to emerging, emerging efforts in order to really achieve tangible science that will sustain uh, basically s uh, the movement towards meeting SDGs and also overcoming political tensions, overcoming our region and also the globe at large. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very <coughs> encouraging model of we can if we want to collaborate. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Dublaka. Nabolka. Nabolka. Yes, How do they? Okay. Uh, please uh, okay. share your thoughts. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a theoretical physicist by training, and I currently direct the International Center for Theor raise your voice a bit. Uh, I currently direct the International Center for Theoretical Physics, which has a unique mission, which has a direct bearing on the year of uh, uh, s uh, that we are celebrating today, the International Year for Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. And I think, in fact, it is even more urgent uh, now that we are entering a very critical moment in human history. Uh, for example, climate change and pandemics, we know that they do not respect uh, national boundaries. It requires a collective global response based on evidence-based uh, thinking and a way of approach. Uh, and that is where the importance of basic sciences cannot be uh, overemphasized. Uh, and that is where the mission of ICTP is really play, has been playing a very important role. Because basic sciences have a dual role to play. One is to offer uh, tools and know-how, intellectual tools, to deal with problems like climate, uh, climate change. But also it offers a common language, as was emphasized also earlier, for international uh, cooperation and dialogue. Because Newton's laws are the same in Paris or in Cairo. And that is what ICTP was founded on. This is the basic premise of uh, an international hub where scientists from all over the world can come together. ICTP welcomes, founded by the Nobel laureate uh, Abdus Salam, uh, it welcomes 6,000 scientists from all over the world every year. Uh, since its inception 60 years ago, uh, something like 200,000 scientists from essentially 180 countries have been to ICTP. Half of them are from the developing countries, fully funded by ICTP. 30% of them are women. And the goal is to bring the young, inspiring, uh, young aspiring uh, graduate students from all over the world in contact with the best researchers, including Nobel laureates, uh, in a way combining excellence with inclusion because ICTP's research has contributed to many major advances in science, including uh, Nobel Prizes. But it really brings uh, them in contact with the uh, scientists in the developing world. And that, I think, is a unique mission because it sort of helps to overcome the barriers of geography and economics and gender and ethnicity, which is what we were talking about, the inequality. And ICTP has been playing that role very much, very importantly, and for that reason, organize international organizations like ICTP um, or UNESCO have a major role to play. I will just quickly say that um, th there was a point about open science and open education. 
and ICTP basically has been doing it. But as was emphasized by Professor Arosh, uh, this is really requires a long-term investment. It's not something that you can do in five years' time. Uh, I think there is a very nice story about Euclid telling the Emperor Ptolemy that there is no royal road to geometry. You cannot learn geometry in two days. And I think one can say the same, the scientific community can tell the policymakers that there is no royal road to advanced technology. Thank you. you. And that is where the uh, uh, organizations like ICTP can continue to play an important role. Thank you so much. Uh, we now turn to our colleagues who are online. First, uh, Dr. Mohamed Hassan, who is uh, someone we looked up to in my younger days of the World uh, Academy of Sciences. Dr. Mohamed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. I hope because the, the line is, is um, very bad. Uh, but I will, um, I will try, I will raise my voice. Um, I, I would like really to confine my short comments uh, to the challenges in basic sciences in uh, science and technology lagging countries. And these are 66 countries identified by TWAS that lag behind the rest of the world in science and technology capacity, especially in research and education in basic sciences. And most of these countries are in Africa and they include all of the 48 least developed countries. There are very few well-qualified researchers in basic sciences compared to applied sciences in these countries. And they get very little funding from their national institutions and governments, as well as international funding agencies to support their research. Uh, in addition, there are very few international centers or programs that support basic sciences in these countries. The ones I am familiar with are the ICTP, which has just been mentioned by its director, the International Science Program of, in Uppsala, Sweden, and TWAS. And I wish to briefly highlight two uh, TWAS programs that support basic scientists working and living in these six, six countries. First, the training of the next generation of highly qualified basic scientists through South-South collaboration. TWAS, I am happy to say, has the largest South-South postgraduate and postdoctoral fellowship program in basic sciences in the world. The fellowships are offered only to students and young researchers in the 66 countries and are tenable at competent research universities in the 66 countries that, are, that I have just mentioned. They have competent research universities and centers of excellence, including countries like China, India, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, and others. Uh, the hosting countries cover all the local expenses. Over 350 fellowships are offered each year, costing the local hosts over $5 million annually. Over 900 PhD students graduated and published over 1,900 peer-reviewed papers, and nearly all of them returned home after graduation. Over 1,000 PhD students are currently on site. And the second, very briefly, is the, the TWAS uh, research grants program. Since 1986, TWAS has been providing competitive research grants in basic sciences, and that is up to $30,000 to young scientists and research groups in the 66 countries, mainly to purchase equipment and material they desperately need for their research. The program received generous support from CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency, and this is North-South Cooperation, essentially. To us, has so far awarded over 2,600 such grants. Now, the point, the important point I would like to make, uh, uh, Madam Chair, is that some of these grantees on TWAS, web shown on TWAS website, successfully address sustainability issues. And I will just give one example, very short example. One such Dr. example Hassan, is a Nigerian We're running student. out of time. If you could uh, just yes, conclude. one minute, if possible. Yes. So I'm just mentioning this Nigerian students who obtained his PhD in chemistry from China under TWAS fellowship program. 
return to Nigeria and later on obtained the research grant from TWAS, which helped him to develop a low cost water purification material made of clay and papaya seeds. He obtained two patents for his discovery and is now working to scale it up, to scale the innovation up. Thank so you. this is an example I think should be highlighted with others. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, the final speaker is Dr. Mike Stratton from Welcome. Is online. Well, Thank you here. for inviting me to speak about aspects of genome science in relation to sustainable development. Large scale, globally collaborative projects have been a core feature of genome science since the sequencing of the 3,000 million letters of DNA code in the human genome in year 2000. First, initiatives in several countries are sequencing the genomes of hundreds of thousands to millions of people, collecting health information, lifestyle information, and various biological measurements from the same individuals. Second, there will be genome sequencing of cancers and normal tissues from around the world for mutations which are not inherited but arise during our lifetimes. And these studies in order to understand the hidden environmental or lifestyle exposures accounting for the geographically widely differing rates of many cancer types. Third, a large scale project will transform understanding of the building blocks of human beings, cells. Our bodies are constructed from trillions of cells, each of which serves a particular function for example, fat cells or muscle cells or nerve cells. Today, cells can be separated from each other and individually sequenced to work out which of the 20,000 genes in the human genome are being used in each one. In this way, a new and more refined human cell atlas will be constructed, discovering all normal cell types and those present in the range of human diseases. Fourth, there will be international initiatives in sequencing the genomes of infectious disease causing microorganisms. During the coronavirus pandemic, more than 10 million COVID-19 viruses were sequenced, making it by far the most extensively sequenced organism on earth. Many other infectious diseases continue to evolve and spread. Malaria causes the death of 500,000 children every year and sequencing large numbers of malaria parasites and the mosquitoes transmitting them will provide public health agencies with early warning of emerging drug resistance, thus enabling changes in treatment strategies. These initiatives will also improve our preparedness for the next pandemic. And fifth, the world is now embarking on sequencing all species. There are about 2 million known, ranging from single cell organisms that are invisible to us to the grand and familiar, such as elephants and oak trees. Homo sapiens has become custodian of life on Earth. Sequencing the genomes of all species will allow us to catalogue and make inventory of life on Earth. It will enable monitoring of individual species and whole ecosystems changing over time, notably in the face of climate change, which we can harness to make Earth a more sustainable, supportive and healthier place. For all these initiatives to achieve optimal impact, we will need to responsibly share the data generated for the whole world to use. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that this has been a bit hurried because we lost time during the day, but I think this last panel, if we still needed to be convinced, has uh, presented us with examples of when we are at our best, is when we collaborate, and that's when we are able to do much more to learn, as we heard from the last speaker, a lot more from nature and how living systems work, and what they do is to collaborate. And if we can learn to collaborate, like our cell bodies are collaborating, then I think the world would be a better place. Thank you very much. And please help me thank our panelists. There is some kind of a black hole, so <laughs> I use this time first to, that you can admire 
this uh, picture. Uh, I was told by, uh, by uh, His Excellency, the President-elect uh, Xaba Korosi, that basic, science, basic sciences are probing the soul of the universe. I find that this uh, image is exactly that. Now I think we should have Charlotte Varakole Lindberg, who should uh, say a few words, uh, especially on uh, what will happen for the closing ceremony of this international year. But the floor is yours, uh, Charlotte. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. Obviously, coming after the soul of the universe is a little bit of a tall order. But um, excellencies, distinguished participants, uh, dear friends of basic sciences and sustainable development, of course, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you today at the formal opening of the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development, representing here CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. And it's, of course, a particular pleasure and a privilege for CERN to be represented here given the key role that UNESCO has played in the establishment of our organization close to 70 years ago, and our convention is deposited here. The dire Deputy Director General also mentioned that earlier today. And of course, I want to thank first and foremost, Michel for his leadership, uh, the International Union for, uh, of Pure and Applied Physics, and the full coalition of partners uh, for behind the International Year for the vision that really underlines this, uh, underlies this initiative. It's their determination, combined of course with the support of UNESCO and all the member states of the United Nations under the leadership of Honduras that has now brought us this very timely opportunity for highlighting the central role of fundamental research in advancing the sustainable development goals. And as we have heard throughout the day with very compelling uh, examples, fundamental research is essential for societal transformation, drives innovation through technological development, it provides educational opportunities and capacity building, and it enables as well as thrives on collaboration across borders. And of course, the technological and scientific advances at CERN have also had a very profound societal impact. We've heard many of them highlighted in the panel just before by, by Ursula, from medical diagnostics, imaging, therapy, computing, to material science, and also environmental protection, just to mention a couple of areas. And of course, these accomplishments are the results of the active participation of our, in our scientific programs of researchers from institutes and universities in our member states, our associate member states, and will beyond, and it's really a demonstration of the inherent value of collaboration. And the International Year will allow all of us to showcase this wide-ranging and very deep societal impact of fundamental research, but also crucially, and we've heard this many times throughout the day, it will allow us to promote the values that underpin this impact. Analytical thinking, openness, inclusion, and very importantly, diversity. A commitment to open science, to uh, the sharing of results of innovation is indispensable to really unlock this potential of fundamental research in support of sustainable development. And Shamila spoke very eloquently to this this morning. I can certainly only echo her call for all of us to join this movement for open science. Now, crucially, the International Year should empower young people of all backgrounds to engage with science and to take part in the journey of scientific inquiry. And we need an emphasis on activities that inspire young people and break down the barriers that may currently prevent them from taking part. The International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development, of course, not an end in and of itself. It's a tool to enable all of us to uh, bring fundamental research closer to serving humanity to the best, uh, to the best of its ability. And we're honored that UPAP has chosen to host the closing of the International Year at CERN in October of 2023. The ceremony will allow us to take stock, to assess the impact of the International Year, and also examine how we will use the outcomes for the years to come. And we look forward to playing a very active role throughout the year, and we look forward to welcoming all of you at the new Science, Education, and Outreach Center at CERN, the CERN Science Gateway, so that we can close the year together. Thank you.
Thank you, Charlotte, for representing CERN for, and for this uh, very nice, interesting remarks and for announcing the, the closing ceremony at CERN in a little bit more than a, than a year from now. So we are coming at the time of the conclusions. Already these remarks were so, some, somewhat uh, conclusive. Uh, dear uh, digni dignitaries, dear colleagues, dear friends, first I want to thank all the speakers, all the, the three moderators, Rolf Feuer, uh, Dominique uh, Leglu, Mampela Ramfele. They did a really a good job. This, uh, this uh, round tables were really very interesting, uh, at least uh, for me. Uh, I want to thank the organizers again, and all of you for this uh, ceremony. You belong to the family of supporters of basic sciences and sustainable development goals. I will repeat the draft statement of the year. Basic sciences are curiosity and inquiry driven. They are the foundations of education and the sources of discoveries which turn into applications which can serve an inclusive sustainable development, improving global equity and well-being together with a healthy and lively planet. All together, education, discoveries, applications, and inclusive sustainable development must boost collaborative and open basic sciences. This is the virtuous circle that we want to promote during this international year of basic sciences for sustainable development and after. To achieve this goal, we shall need you, teachers, scientists, the private sector, decision makers, and the society at large to share this vision and act accordingly. So as I said uh, in my, op my opening remark, already we have 49 international scientific unions and research organizations, which are leading this international year as, as members of the steering committee. Uh, and 110 national science academies, scientific networks and associations are supporting the movement. We hope and we know that this figure will increase all along the year. These unions, organizations, academies, scientific networks and associations are the foundations for the success of the year, of this international year, and for further initiatives beyond this international year. All these organizations will set up thousands of events during this international year, which will inspire greater engagement in science, encourage young people towards careers in the field, highlight the value of fundamental research for society at large. These events can be local, territorial, national, regional, and also flagship global events in each continent. For these flagship events in each, uh, in each continent, we foresee already one event in Vietnam in September on science, ethics, and human development for Asia. One event also in September in Serbia for Europe on basic sciences and sustainable development one event in Rwanda for Africa on uh, basic sciences for survival, one event uh, maybe not yet decided in, in Morocco for Arab-speaking countries on mathematics and quantum technologies. We are discussing with Honduras, one event in Honduras for Latin America, for South America, uh, probably on open science, and hopefully one event in North America and one event in Oceania which remain to be defined. We also hope that thanks to the support of its president, a major IYBSSD event could be organized under his auspices during the 77th UN General Assembly, and that, that this event may lead to, the, funda may lead to the, fund the foundation for a decade of actions which that will follow the IYBSSD 2022 a decade of basic sciences for sustainable de development. To achieve this, we need the engagement of UN member states and hope that those who have supported us so far will help starting with Honduras and Vietnam. What could be the indicators of success 
which could be highlight, highlighted at CERN at the closing ceremony. First, the number of events, their geographical distribution, their participants, and their impact. Second, concrete commitments from governments, parliaments, to appropriately funding basic sciences over the next decade. Third, investments and programs on STEM education and on the promotion of educational programs aimed at bringing future scientists and engineers and policymakers closer together. Fourth, initiatives to build solid bridges between science, policymakers, and the rest of the society in order to use evidence-based decisions and not fake news for the solution of global problems. Five-fifths, mobilizing all forces for a sustainable development, for global equity, and a healthy, li lively planet. To conclude, let's uh, symbolically, I was not permitted to, to uh, do that physically, let's uh, symbolically enlighten the torch of knowledge for a better world. Thank you and see you in other events. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Excellencies, honorable ministers, dear scientists, dear colleagues and friends of science, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to conclude this opening ceremony for the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. Let me once again extend to all of you my humble and sincere gratitude for your participation for sharing with us your knowledge, information, experiences, and lessons learned of how to put a face to science. Let me sincerely thank all those participants who were unable to make it to Paris. Let me also thank the ministers who have joined us today, the speakers, the moderators. I want to humbly thank also Professor Michel Spiro and his team who have worked tirelessly to bring this to fruition today. I want to thank the Republic of Honduras, the Honorable Minister who has been with us today, and all the other ministers who've traveled from afar to share with us. But I also want to thank all the natural science sector of UNESCO, my dear colleagues, who have worked very hard to make this happen. I want to thank Ahmed Fahmy, who's defended this also with Michelle Spiro in the General Assembly, I want to thank Amal Kasri and all those who have acted behind the scenes, who have worked tirelessly days and night, despite the pandemic and despite the COVID, to bring us here today in this successful ceremony. Thank you very much to all of you. But I also want to thank all those who've acted behind the scenes. All the invisible that we do not see. I want to thank all those responsible for the logistics, the security who have enabled us to meet here today. But I also want to thank our exceptional translators. Thank you for being able to translate the science. During this event, we have seen how basic sciences can help to identify mechanisms, but also to make the best use of scientific knowledge and information. I have the most difficult task here today to close this particular ceremony. And I think I'm going to be a little bit bold and share with you some ideas and thoughts. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Transformation is already happening. The problem we have is that transformation is in the wrong direction. What we need 
is more and better science. We need basic science. We need scientific research. We need systems. We need research platforms. And we need international scientific solidarity. We need interdisciplinarity. And we need all the streams of science to come together, including the local indigenous and rural information that can contribute to a better world. Now, how many people know that they owe their smartphone to the discovery of a transistor radio in a physics laboratory more than half a century ago? You will agree. There's no lack of complex problems to solve in our contemporary world. We've heard of climate change, the water crisis, the biodiversity loss, the food crisis. But did you also know that half of the elements which exist on Earth today could be sh in short supply within 100 years? So there is support for basic science that makes economic sense. But science is not a flash in the pan. It needs investment. Science systems need to be supported. But today, eight out of 10 countries invest more than 1% of the GDP. So this is my appeal to the world leaders today. You cannot achieve your national development strategies and your national development economies and your knowledge-based economies, and you won't be able to feed the hungry nations that you lead unless you invest in your basic science and research, unless you invest in research for development. We need to nurture our young people, our children at a young age to appreciate curiosity science. We need partnerships. We need to define STEM education for the future. But even though science may be an important driver of innovation, we must not lose, sci uh, we must not lose sight of the fact that it is driven by curiosity. Basic scientists thus need the freedom to dream and to contemplate. Years or even decades can pass between a eureka moment in the laboratory and a concrete application. 2030 is round the corner. It's not enough. We must invest for the future because there is no planet B. We must invest because it's ethically correct to do so. We must promote basic sciences because it is the beating heart of sustainable development. Now, scientists have always learned from observing nature. Remember how, four centuries ago, an English scientist called Isaac Newton developed his law of gravitation after observing how an apple fell from a tree. Human progress has been built one step at a time by men and women around the world who over thousands of years have been driven by curiosity to ask why and how and who have done everything in their power to answer those questions. As Isaac Newton himself put it, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Let us then seize this opportunity of the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development to give our scientists everywhere in the world a chance to stand on the shoulders of giants to see further. Like music, science is universal. We've had the pleasure of listening to exceptional musicians, and I would like to thank them too. But have you ever wondered about the mathematics in music and how every chord and every sound is harmonized? And this is the millennium seconds that brings this harmony in the music. So arts, culture, and science are all interlinked today to give us the harmony of the ecosystems that we live in. But if we cannot measure the science, how can we manage it? We really indeed must put a face to the basic sciences. In the context of the pandemic, the vital importance of basic sciences has, brought, has been brought into unprecedented focus. The world is indeed in a race against time to rethink development strategies. And we must all collectively contribute to a better world. We must definitely put a face to science. Excellencies, in closing, I would like to say, basic science is something of an unsung hero. Despite being the source of new knowledge 
and the basis of all the countless applications even bringing us here today that has transformed our world and made our lives more comfortable. Unfortunately, the vital role for basic science in sustainable development is so often overlooked. So join the movement and let's put our hearts into this beating heart of basic science for sustainable development. I thank you all. I thank the participants, hundreds who have joined us and unable to be with us here in Paris. At UNESCO, your home. Please take back the message. We need more and better science. We need more women in science. We need more basic science so that we could live better because there is no planet B. But we must protect this for nations to come. We must put basic science to the heart of every one of the SDGs, not just for 2030, but beyond. I thank you very much. Stay safe. And please welcome back home again to UNESCO in the future. Thank you.